Okay, let's get started. Um, so, first I wanted to uh, talk about this correction from the last lecture. Um, and uh, then I'll talk about natural deduction and then proof terms, um, which leads us into lambda calculus and related things. So, we actually come from, in some sense, we come from concurrent programming, which we did with the sequence calculus to functional programming, which is related to natural deduction. So we'll see that connection. And we'll only start in that today, and we'll see more of that um, on Wednesday. So where we went wrong last time, um, we, we were proving this following theorem. So if um, Okay, we have a cut-free sequence proof of A. Then there's a chaining proof of A. Um, okay, remember the chaining proof of A was restricted so that you could apply left rules only to a formula in focus. And here you can apply left rules as you wish. So this is the hard part of the theorem because to go from here to here, we just ignore the focus. So that's very easy. And to go from here to here, you have to somehow show that it's okay to focus on one formula and chain together the rules on that one formula. Okay? And so the easy cases would be, for example, if there is a, uh, um, an invertible rule applied here, like the invertible right rule, because there's a corresponding invertible rule over here, and we just apply the induction hypothesis. So that's the easy part. The difficult part is that if you apply a non-invertible rule over here, okay, so let's do a case on this. So maybe the part was delta 1, delta 2 proves A tensor B because delta 1 we can prove A and delta 2 we can prove B. Okay, And this was D, so this is D, this would be D1 and this would be D2. Okay, so now by induction hypothesis, we get over here, um, let's call this, I don't know, E. So we get delta 1 proves A. And uh, so that's E1, which is by induction hypothesis. And we get delta 2 arrow um, B. And that's E2, which is by induction hypothesis. But what we have to show is somehow that Delta 1 together with delta 2, we can prove a tensor B. And we can't directly apply the right rule, because we can apply right rule only to a formula in focus in this calculus. And this is not in focus. And not the right rule, but the right rule for tensor, because that's a, a non-invertible connective. Okay. So here's the proof attempt that we did. Okay, so we say, okay, well, let's put it in focus. Then you can apply, this was tensor right. Then you can apply the tensor right rule. And then we have to prove delta 1 arrow A in focus. And we have delta 2 arrow B in focus. And we say, OK, we're OK if we can prove from here we can get to here. And on the, sp on the spur of the moment, where we're not able to come up with a counterexample for this. OK? Um, or at least I wasn't able to. And if one of you did, they didn't talk about it. OK? Um, so I tried to prove this, but this is obviously false. If you can prove A, we can't necessarily always focus on the right-hand side. OK? And a very simple example would be something like if we have small a, This is one that uses tensor. Okay, so this should be true, right? And to prove this, where do we need to focus? Well, we can't focus on A. It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. We can't focus on the right-hand side because it would require us to break down the tensor. We'd have to split our assumptions, but we can because if A goes one way and A implies B goes the other way, we're going to be in trouble. Okay. So if you focus on the right-hand side, we won't be able to do the proof. Everybody agreed? OK. So what do we have to focus on? Well, we have to focus on this formula. Okay. 
And then we get A to the proof of A, and we take B tensor C to the proof of B tensor C, and we can complete the proof. Okay. But right now, here we're stuck, so we can't focus here. So this fact that we always proceed by focusing on the right here and then continue here just doesn't work. Because we can't necessarily focus on this formula just because this was a tensor right rule here. Okay. So we can't do it that way. Okay. Um, okay. And so instead we have to get our, um, our hammer. Okay. So in these kind of proofs, if we couldn't prove it directly, what kind of hammer do we have? Yeah? Cut. cut, exactly. Of course, we don't have cut yet because we haven't proven it yet. Okay, But you know, that would be the thing to do. So what would we cut here? Any suggestions how we would apply cut? Say that again, I couldn't quite hear that. Okay. Okay. So let's take, um, so we take A, comma B, arrow A, tensor B. Then we cut this with E1, and we get delta 1 together with B proves A tensor B. So this is cut, and over here we have. E1, right? And then we cut this with E2. And of course, these would be admissible rules, right? Presumably. Um, and we would get our conclusion. OK, so if we can prove this and we can have cut as an admissible rule, then we would be in good shape. Do you see that? How do we prove this? Focus on the right. And then we break it up. And then here we use the identity, which is a uh, some admissible rule. And we use the identity over there, which is an admissible rule. And that part of the proof we actually got right. Okay. So if we can prove that, which we can, if we have the identity as a derived rule, and we have these two cuts as a derived rule, then we'll be OK with this proof. OK, so um, the thing we have to do is we have to engineer the cut rules correctly, the proof of admissibility of cut in this system. And once we have that, then the rest of the proof here will go very straightforwardly. All the difficulty in the proof is contained in proving cut for the system and identity, which was not so hard. Okay. OK, and so then um, last time I was goaded into stating some cut principles that were invalid, okay, just so I could prove that other theorem, which wasn't true. Okay. Um, so I, I don't want to take too much time with that, so you can look it up in the lecture notes. But basically what you do is we know what cut principle we need at the end. And the, the one that we need at the end is delta gets you A and delta prime together with A gets you C. And then from delta, delta prime, we get C. And one, one property is that none of these formulas here have something in focus. Because when we translate a proof from here to here, this here is nothing in focus. So the focus only arises during the proof. Okay. So if we have two things which nothing in focus, we can, we can form this and there won't be a problem. Okay, and then you have to see what kind of cuts you need in order to be able to prove that. So you go through the cases, and you try to be very careful not to get anything that would actually be unsound. Okay, um, and the main difficulty is if you have a formula in focus here and a formula in focus here, and it's not A, then when you put them together, you'd have two formulas in focus, which would be illegal. Okay, um, and so you just have to be very careful when you write down the cases. That's um, and I was not careful enough in writing down the cases um, last time. Okay. 
And so the things which are easy to do is, for example, if this formula is in focus here or this one is in focus here, then those are the easy cases. Um, and um, when, there is, uh, when the cut formula is not in focus on either side, then it's a little bit tricky. Um, so I encourage you to look at the notes to see how that works out. Okay. Um, are there questions on this? Okay. So, um, so with that, um, we have now the focusing system where we saw for some applications over the end of last lecture, which is the fact that now you can go back and forth between inference rules and formulas. So we can take derived inference rules like you know a diamond, a diamond nickel goes to a quarter, and we can turn that and express it as a formula. We can also do the opposite. If we have a formula, we can focus on it to see what derived rules it would correspond to. Okay, so we can go back and forth between these different things. Um, and uh, that's a very strong restriction of the search space. So in some sense, we have a whole sequence of different systems. One, the, the system of sequence with cut, which is very permissive because we have the general identity and the general cut as a rule, so we can do a lot of proofs. Then the cut-free uh, sequence calculus, okay, where identity only exists for atomic formulas and cut is not at all in there, but cut is admissible. Okay, so we could use cut, but it doesn't directly correspond to a proof constructor. Okay. And then this system um, in which inversion is not forced, but focus is forced. So when you focus on some assumption, you have to continue to apply um, the non-invertible rules only to that formula. And then the fully focused version, where you have to apply all the inversions first, then you have to focus on something and continue to focus on that. And the difference between these last three systems was just in the two rules. So this one, um, I'll just show the, okay, so there's one where you focus on A, then there is one where you focus on A, okay, and so if you make no restrictions on these rules at all, okay, so there can be a uh, formulas already in focus here, then it's essentially isomorphic to the cut-free sequence calculus. Because if you can have multiple formulas in focus, that's really not any restriction at all. Okay. If you force this to be, there's no formula in focus here, and this is the only one, okay, and, or the same thing here, this cannot be in focus and nothing in here, then you get the chaining calculus, where you have to chain rules on this formula, but invertible rules can be applied arbitrarily. And if you make the restriction, that the formulas, when you apply this rule, the formulas in delta all have to be negative or positive atoms, okay? Um, then um, you get, you force the inversions to happen first until the positive things here have been inverted. And of course, this has to be restricted appropriately, okay? Um, and then you get the full focus in calculus, okay? Where the inversion rules always have to apply eagerly before you can focus on something. And of course, this rule has to be restricted similarly. Delta has to be um, all um, negative formula or positive atoms, and C has to be a negative atom or positive formula. Okay. Okay. So that's the restrictions. These are the three systems that make you know sort of um, successively more complicated restriction. An interesting thing is if you force the inversion, then the cut property does not become much more complicated. Uh, but the identity prop, the proof of the identity property becomes significantly more complicated. So this, we might actually come back to this at some point later in the semester. I'm not 100% sure, but it's something that I'm, I'm considering. So meanwhile now I'm going to change gears, okay, unless there's a question or other remarks on this. Okay. So I'm going to move on and have a completely different system. And uh, it's course, if it's course going to be related to the systems that we already have, okay. and that's the system of natural deduction. Okay. So in the sequence calculus, we arranged it so that all the rules decompose the connectives going bottom up. Okay. So. So the way I think about this is that we have some delta on the left, we have a sequent arrow, 
let's take the cut-free calculus for the moment. Um, and then we have the formula here. And we work upwards here with the right rules. And we work upwards here in the left rules. And then when we're done, they mediate the identity. Okay? So that's how the proofs proceed. You always build the proof bottom up. Okay? Um, and so the connectives are characterized by the, how the right rules work and how the left rules work. And the right rules tell you how to, decomp how to, how to achieve a goal by breaking down into sub-goals. And the left rules tell you how, if you have a, a resource, how can you use that resource? So it's use and you, uh, proving a goal or verification over here. Okay. Now a natural deduction, what we're going to do is we're going to take this. There's going to be an analogous thing to the right rules, which are called introduction rules, which are going to work essentially the same way. But we take the left rule and we turn them upside down. So this is sequence calculus. And a natural deduction, the way it's going to look is that we're going to have some line here in the middle. But there's going to be some rules going down here. These are called the elimination rules. And we have some introduction rules. And these correspond to the right rules. And the elimination rules are like the left rules, but inverted, because they go in the opposite direction. Okay. And so what's the identity rule here actually is some kind of uh, rule in the middle here, which switches direction in which you reason from reasoning downwards for, uh, to reasoning upwards, or upwards to downwards, whatever way you want to think about it. Okay. So the identity rule, which is this, is this place where we switch direction in our reasoning. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I think the main reason that normally linear logic is not presented in this way, okay, is that Girard conceives of linear logic as being classical, okay? And in a classical linear logic, you don't have just a single formula on the right-hand side, but you have multiple formulas on the right-hand side, okay? So not just one, but multiple ones, which is the thing that distinguishes between the intuitions and the classical system. And that's not so easy to represent a natural deduction. Having a natural deduction system with multiple conclusions is unnatural deduction, okay? So that's why we don't do that, okay? So instead, we have to have some other way to represent the classical nature of these derivations. And that doesn't work out as cleanly as it works out in the sequence calculus. And you, you will see that there's also some other oddities about the system as we go through the connectives that don't show up so much in the sequence calculus, another reason to prefer sequence calculus. But if you want to think about functional programming and how linear, what kind of um, properties of computations are described on functions by by linear types, if you want, okay, then um, you're much better off with the natural deduction representation because that corresponds to a lambda calculus. While the sequence calculus doesn't really directly correspond to a lambda calculus, but something more like something that would um, do some kind of concurrent computation, as we saw. Okay. Okay. So how do we actually work with this? Okay. So let's start with something very simple. Okay. So. Uh, um, so I'm going to write natural deduction like this. Um, okay. So this is what we call a linear hypothetical judgment. Linear hypothetical judgment. Okay. So these are my assumptions. This is what I'm trying to prove. So in that sense, it's very similar to what we had in the sequence calculus, except that I'm never going to apply a rule to anything in delta except you taking things out of there and put them on the right-hand side. So rather than having a left rule that applies something directly to delta, I only remove things from delta. So that all these, all these, both of these rules, elimination and introduction, work always on the right-hand side. Okay. So a very simple example is this one. So if I have A with B, and I try to get it from delta, okay, I can break it down into proving A and proving B. Okay. And my assumptions here, my resources get duplicated as before. Okay. And uh, you'll see throughout that there's going to be a very close connection between the introduction rules and the right rules. And this would be the introduction rule for width. Okay. Now, the elimination rule is going to be like the left rule except turned upside down. Um, anybody remember what the left rules are for width? Yeah, you have to choose one of them. 
OK, so we have A with B. We can get A. And we have A with B. We can get B. And um, the resources are not being changed. So the resources are along for the ride. OK? Now, I have a question on this. Yep. That's also a natural reduction style. Okay. Because that's very similar then to, kind of very similar to the sequence style, except that the formula we eliminated appears on the right hand side. That's right. So there was an analysis done by um, Sarah Negri, um, who actually gives a uniform system. Um, what she calls a uniform system that has both natural reductions and sequent calculus as subsystems. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in that case, the the elimination both or with would look something like this. Okay, and then you say um, you get the sequent calculus if you force this delta to be this just a, the same as a with b, uh -huh. because then this delta here would be a with b. Yeah. And then you would have to get. Yes, and then yeah. we go the other way by using cut. And you, you can go the other way by using cut, or you could force C to be A. Yes. And then you would get natural deduction. OK. So this is some kind of a generalization of both of these systems together. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I was just wondering, because for, for, for example, sum, yeah. it has to look like this. Yeah, so we'll come to that. Okay. Yeah. But um, so you can get this kind of uniform system, but what you'll find is that if you try to do proof terms on this, from the from the functional programming perspective, it's kind of an odd system, okay? Because it has aspects of sequence calculus and natural deduction in it. Um, okay. So I'll follow the more traditional um, natural deduction presentation. Okay. So we have these two now. There is some criteria that we can apply, which are similar to showing that our left and right rules are in balance. Okay, and the criteria would be something like I'm going to talk it only through in this one case because um, um, we already went through this in the sequence calculus. But it says if there's if I have if I can introduce a connective and then eliminate it again, I can I can get rid of this detour. Okay. So if I have an AND introduction followed by this AND elimination, how can I eliminate that detour? Just the, first premise the first premise of the AND introduction is exactly the conclusion. And if I happen to do the second elimination, then I would take the second premise here. So if I first introduce and then immediately eliminate, I can get rid of that detour. Okay. Um, and the other property would say that whenever I have a proof of A with B, I can always massage it so that the last inference rule that applies the AND introduction. And that corresponds to the identity expansion. Okay. So I will not talk about this in today's lecture, but I might come back to that later. Um, so the way we're going to justify these rules instead is essentially proving that you have some kind of relationship to the sequence calculus. Okay. So we can justify them internally, but I just don't want to spend too much time on that. Okay. Um, okay. So that seems pretty easy. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> Well, there's one generic rule that says if I have an assumption A, then I get the conclusion A. Okay. And we'll call this the hypothesis rule. And there's nothing else allowed. If we, once we allow gamma, gamma can be left over there. We don't have to use the things in gamma. Okay. But there cannot be anything else on the left-hand sides besides A and delta okay, for this to be linear. Um, now, we have to be careful. When we think about the connection to the sequence calculus, the hypothesis rule is not the identity rule. Okay? Because the identity rule 
Okay, corresponds to the place where the elimination rule and introduction rule reasoning comes together. Okay, so it's not the identity rule in particular. We're not going to break it down to try to work for atomic formulas only because that wouldn't make any sense. Because this is the only way we can ever use an assumption. Okay, so if the assumption is not atomic, okay, then if you try to re restrict this to atomic formulas only, we could never use assumptions like A implies B. Okay. So you have to be careful, even though it looks formally the same, it has a very different meaning in natural deduction. Okay, okay. so um, let's do implication. Um, so we might have um, A, how do we prove A implies B? A lolly B. Okay, so it's an introduction rule, so it works just like the right rules before, right? Do you wanna? Okay, so we just add A to the context, and we try to prove B. So that's the easy part. Now for the elimination rule, I put myself into the position where I have the proof of A lolly B, okay? And that has to be a premise of some rule, right? So unlike the left rule, uh, in the sequent calculus, we're always working on the right-hand side, so it's something that I must have a proof of. Okay. Okay. So, how do we use that assumption? A implies B. Yeah. Yeah. So from delta prime, we can get A, then delta together with delta prime, we can get B, and that's the elimination rule. Okay. Um, okay. So you always have to read the, if you want a good, good reading in terms of proof search of these rules, you always have to think about the introduction rules from the bottom to the conclusion, and the elimination rules from the top to the bottom. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, let's think about um, proving that these work. Okay. Of course, you, there's many more connectives, but... Um, um, Let's think about how the proof would be organized. Okay, so we'd have to be able to go in both directions. Um, let's see, which one do we want to do first? Um, let's say, okay, any preference? Hmm? No, which direction? Do we want to go from sequent calculus to natural deduction or from natural deduction to sequent calculus? Um, okay, so let's. Okay, from sequent, then it should be true in natural deduction. Okay, so let's look at some cases. Um, okay, so initial sequence, let's start with that. Okay, how do we prove the result? Yeah? It's just the hypothesis rule, right? Weird, we said they weren't the same, but somehow they're reusing it, okay? Okay, um, so next thing, Flavio want to do implication. So let's do the right rule first, right? In the spirit of doing the easy case first. A or B, because delta comma A proves B. Obviously, now we imply the induction hypothesis, delta A, B, delta A, B. So that's by the induction hypothesis, right? Okay, so we're in good shape. So obviously, things have to become hard. And you would expect that the left rule is a place where that shows up because that's where the two systems are different. So, so the case would be if we have delta, and one of these things is A arrow B, we're trying to prove C, C like this, because from delta we can prove A, and delta comma B 
we can prove C. Okay, so let's call this D1 and this D2. Okay, how do we, how do we proceed in, in such a proof? Delta prime B, yeah. We fix all typos, that's the first step. Okay. We apply the induction hypothesis, we remind ourselves what we have to prove and just see if we can fill the gap, right? So what do we get by induction hypothesis? We get delta proves A, and we get delta prime together with B proves C. And what we have to show here is delta, delta prime A implies B proves C, okay. Hmm? We first have to pull the A lolly B. Okay. So we have A lolly B proves A lolly B. Is that what you mean? Pull it out of the hypothesis? Okay. So that would be the hypothesis rule. Okay. Now we have that proof there, okay. Delta proves A, and so then we get delta together with A lolly B proves B, right? Okay, so now we have a problem because we'd like to cut And then we would get this, right? Make sense? Okay, so this is by induction hypothesis. This is by induction hypothesis, okay? The only problem is that this is the natural induction calculus. We don't really have a rule of cut, right? Yeah? You can use the introduction rule to move the other side. Okay. So, Okay, so we have induction hypothesis delta B proves C, then we get delta prime proves B arrow C, right, using the introduction rule. Okay, so that's by the introduction rule. Now we have delta prime proves B arrow C, and this thing proves B, so we combine the resources and get C. Okay. Make sense? Okay, so fortunately we don't need cut because we can play this trick. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so obviously if those three cases work, everything else is gonna work, right? So, um, so this turned out to be the easy direction in some sense. Or maybe both directions are easy, who knows, right? Um, okay, let's think about the other direction then. Uh, okay, now if this is the hypothesis rule, how do we use that? How do we prove A? A? Yeah, so either we can, well, in this thing is actually a rule, right, identity at A, or if we're trying to get a cut-free one, then we would say it's admissible, okay. Hmm, in this direction too, this thing turned into that, okay. But it's a little odd, okay. All right, now here, if this, then this, okay, because the rules correspond to each other, okay. So obviously the hard part, if there is a hard part, has to come in when an elimination rule is being used over here. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so we have delta proves A implies B. Delta prime proves A. So delta, delta prime proves B. Okay, strategy, apply the induction hypothesis. Okay, so we find from delta 
in the sequence calculus, we prove A implies B. So that's one. And from delta prime, we can prove A. That's also by induction hypothesis. What we have to show is that delta together with delta prime proves B in the sequence calculus. OK? So how do we do that? Here? Yes. No, we're given this by the induction hypothesis. So the right rule would be going in the wrong direction. Yeah, we want to use, it's obvious that we want to use the left rule in this one, okay? Um, because in elimination rules, according to the picture that I drew, corresponds to a left rule, okay? So we want to get a left rule. So if you have A, A lolly B, we want to use a cut. Um, so what are the other things that we need so we can apply the cut? Um, delta prime. Well, I think there's an even easier way to do it. Yeah? Um, I have a question about the previous course. I think that will work because we already proved that this rule is universal. I mean, uh, A is only B. It's uh, less than the reasonable rule. Okay. So we don't apply the rule, we apply inversion. Yeah, so we could do that. Then we'd have to be careful for the rules that are not invertible, right? OK. So there's another way to do this. And so I think, let's try this. Can we prove that? OK. And the reason we did that is we can put A implies B on the left-hand side, so we can cut it with this. So when we do that cut here, what do we get? Delta together with A gives me B, is that right? We cut out this, delta goes over here, A stays there. And now we can cut this with this, right? Delta prime proves A. And we apply one more cut. Apply cut here of A only B. And a cut here of A. And then we get this. So Yeah, we can do that, but then we have to prove this. Okay. Okay, so you want to prove delta prime together with A lolly B proves B. Delta prime implies A by the induction hypothesis. And then from B, we have to prove B, which is the identity at B. So we have that. And now we still need one, one time cut, correct? Delta proves A over B, cut, and we get delta. Delta prime proves B. Okay? Did I do that right? Yeah. But that's okay. One cut. Yeah. So we have one cut over here, we needed two cuts over there. So this is a more direct proof. Yeah, I was just wondering why you didn't do that. I don't know. <laughs> no particular reason. Um, so, and, uh, so here we need the identity at B and cut at A lolly B. And over here, we needed the cut at A, lolly B, and another cut at A. OK. Uh, in this proof here, you mean? Yeah. In this proof here, we need the identity at A and the identity at B. Yeah, so this is more economical. OK, so we don't, we don't do it this way. OK. But in any case, one thing that becomes clear, because we have all sledgehammers of identity and cut, these proofs are actually pretty easy. right? We don't have to like, 
generalized induction hypothesis or whatever, we just can prove it in both directions by simple inductions. Okay. Um, okay. So the proof becomes more complicated if you want to relate the cut free sequence calculus to normal natural deductions. So we can define when a natural deduction is normal, okay, um, which is um, it doesn't have an introduction for a connective followed by an elimination for that same connective, okay. Um, and then we, have, we can establish a relationship between um, cut free sequence proofs on one side and normal natural deduction on the other, okay. So I don't really want to do that because. It's a useful exercise, but um, it doesn't really get me much further for what I want to accomplish uh, right now. Um, so for now, we can just see that these two things correspond to each other and that the correspondence is not too difficult to prove um, in either direction. Okay. So they, they prove the same things, but the structure of the proof is quite different. Okay. So let's do some example proofs just to uh, make sure we have a handle on this. And then I'm going to do a couple of more connectives. Okay. So what I wanted to prove is um, A lolly B with C proves. Um, actually, what is the interaction law here? A lolly B with C is equivalent to. Only C, okay. I claim it holds in both directions. Let's just do one of them, okay. So we can look at the left hand side, but we focus usually on the right hand side, okay. So um, we prove this by the and right rule, okay. By the way, the right rule is invertible in this if and only if the, the sorry, the introduction rule is invertible if and only if the right rule in the seeking calculus is invertible. So this is always a safe thing to do. And so then we have two premises, the first one of which is same assumption, and we have to prove A arrow B, and the other one here is symmetric. Okay, so now we have to prove that. How do we proceed here? We do the introduction rule, right, because we know that should be okay. Okay, so at this point it looks just very much like a sequence calculus proof of the same thing because we proceed on the right hand side. Okay, um, okay. so now, now it becomes weird because we can only work on the right hand side but it's become, come down to something, an atom, because okay, so we can't break that down anymore. So it has to be the result of some kind of elimination rule. Okay. Um, but that's a weird way to think about it. Another way to think about it is somewhere above here we're going to use this, A arrow B with C. And somewhere up here we're going to use A. Okay. Um, and these are going to be on the right hand side of this thing. Okay. And we just have to figure out how to close that gap. Remember the elimination rules you have to use from the top to the bottom and the introduction rules you use from the bottom to the top. Okay, how can we do that now? I guess I've kind of given it away the way I wrote it there. Okay. That is the elimination rule. And so we have an A here, and we have that whole formula over here. And then we get, uh, we have to join those two formulas together. And we get B with C over here, okay. Blocking out the left hand side, how do we proceed now? Yeah, we apply the elimination rule. Okay, and this is the hypothesis rule here, and this is the hypothesis rule. Okay, so that's our proof, okay. So when you write these things, you just have to be mindful that you have to think about the elimination rules as going from something that you know to some of the pieces, and the introduction rules go from the bottom up. Okay. Okay. So, we should continue. By the way, all the connectors I have on the board so far are positive or negative? Negative. Okay. 
Negative are the ones that have invertible right rules. Okay. So let's do some positive things. Okay. Uh, let's do a tensor. So what would be the introduction rule for tensor? Yeah? Okay? It's just the same thing as a right rule. Okay? So that's a very mechanical thing. So if we know A tensor B, okay, how do we use that? Okay, so this is a tricky part, okay, and it's, it's very much like the rule for width that Christina proposed before, okay. Um, so in order to decompose it downwards, we cannot just say from delta we can prove A, or from delta we can prove B, because that would be, these are the rules for this one here. And you can imagine that it would be incorrect to do so if I had a rule that says from delta I could get from A tensor B, I can extract A, okay? So in fact, that's wrong, right? Because that would be this one here. And you can imagine what goes wrong if you try to do that, okay? Maybe I'll ask you to actually figure out in the homework. But it's pretty similar to what you already did in the homework when you figured out that width and tensor really have to have different sets of rules. If you try to put them together, then you have things like, you know, contraction is admissible or weakening is admissible, which we don't want. So we don't have these things available to us. So the best thing we can do is, well, this means A and B together in the same state. So let's say we have A and B together with some other resources, delta prime. Whatever we can derive from that, we can derive from delta together with delta prime. Okay. So that's the rule that we have to have um, for, for a tensor. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a slightly weird aspect. So in the sequent calculus, all the rules are very uniform. They have a left rule and a right rule. Both of them work bottom up and decompose the pieces, and it's a very clean, simple thing. In natural reduction, okay, these are very clean and simple. So if you go upwards with the introduction rule, when you go downwards with the elimination rule, it's all very um, natural, okay? But then when you come to tensor, okay, then you have to have this weird extra formula C sort of hanging around, okay? Um, now, in the sequence calculus, you might imagine that you have this extra formula C hanging around for every left rule, okay? Um, and that makes all the rules kind of uniform. While here, there's a definite difference between a rule like this, where you only have a delta hanging around, and here, we have a delta prime and a C when you're trying to eliminate A tensor B, okay? Okay. Yes. Right. And in fact, the answer is yes, like I said earlier. We can do that. Okay. okay, so maybe this is a good time to come to why we're doing it this way and not this kind of a sort of a uniform way. Okay. And that has to do with the connection of all of this to uh, functional terms. Okay. And uh, let's see how much time. Okay. Um, maybe I'll do, um, yeah, I'll do that first. I might do the, uh, I do rules for bang later on. Okay. Okay, so when we do um, a proof term assignment, okay, we want to capture the structure of the proofs in the terms that we assign in such a way that we can kind of reconstruct the proof. Okay. So the way we're going to do that is the, the main judgment is going to look like this. Um, actually, I'm going to write it out, x1, a1, xn, an, and over here we have a term m, which has type a, okay, and so I'm still going to abbreviate this with delta, 
even though you have to think of all the assumptions as being labeled, or just think of them here as being implicitly labeled, if you will. Okay. So the difference what we had before in the sequence calculus is that in the sequence calculus we had a process P here, and we actually gave a name to the channel along which it communicated. Now in this functional interpretation, we don't need to do that because a function returns a unique value, and all the rules assume that, so we don't have to assign a channel to that because we don't have communication, communicating processes. So you don't need to keep track how the different processes are plugged together along these channels. You just say if a function returns its value, period. Okay. So therefore, no naming over here, um, but we do have to name the assumptions. Okay. So now we just have to rewrite the rules to make sure we understand what's going on. So the first rule up there, the hypothesis rule, is just says if x colon a, then x colon a. And this is a hypothesis rule, okay? So um, hypothesis rules correspond to the use of a variable in a term m. Okay. Um, let's see. So let's look at the end introduction. Okay. So the end introduction would say from delta I have m, which is type a, and delta n, which is b. Then the pair m comma n would correspond to proof of A with B, okay? And then the first the elimination would say if I have M, which is A with B, then the first projection, which is usually written as pi 1 of M, would be A, B A, and the second projection by 2 of m would be b. And if I introduce and then eliminate a connective, okay, so if I introduce this and then eliminate it, it would be something like pi 1 applied to the pair m comma n, right? We introduce the pair and then we eliminate it, okay? Then we already have evidence for the conclusion a here, and that was this premise here, which was m, okay? So you can see introducing then eliminating a connection, a connective is very similar to the kind of reductions we did in the sequence calculus, except now on these functional terms. And pi 2 of m and n reduces to n. Okay. So these correspond to these uh, cut reductions, and here we call them local reductions. And just like the cut reductions form the basis of the computation interpretation of sequence as communicating processes, the, uh, these local reductions on these terms correspond to the basis or form the basis for functional computation. And the added dif dif difference to the usual way of interpreting proofs is that this kind of functional computation is on linear terms. So it corresponds to some kind of linear lambda calculus because the variables must be used exactly once, right? This is the only assumption you're allowed to have here. Um, yeah. Right, but corresponds to cut in this case it is sort of like a left rule meeting a right rule, corresponds to an introduction followed by an elimination. Okay. Actually, cut will come in the second because they're is something doesn't quite correspond to cut, but um, plays a similar role, which is substitution. And we'll see that when we come to a linear implication. So let me get rid of this because we've just gotten rid of this um, over there. Okay. So um, let's look at the implication here. So if you have delta, and we have delta, and we have an x colon a, and we have some term m, which has type b, okay. then the proof of a implies b is like a function which takes an argument of type a and gives you a result of type b. So we're going to write this as lambda x dot m, which goes from a to b. Okay. So if you want, you can put the type a on the x or not. It's not so important for our purposes right now. Okay. Um, okay. So Remember, in the sequence calculus, what does this correspond to? A or O B on the right-hand side. Anybody remember? It listens on the channel for A and then it becomes the channel that provides 
So if you offer that service along some kind of a channel, we input something of type A on that channel and then behave like B. Okay? So that's very, very similar to this interpretation, right? Because this says it's a function which inputs an X of type A and then returns something of type B. The only real difference is that at that level is that here we, we have a specific channel in which we offer that kind of communication. And here, the term itself is expected to return a value. So we don't have a channel associated with that. Okay. Um, so the difference is more obvious when you look at the elimination rule. So if we have delta and we have m is such a function and we have delta prime and n has the right type a, then you can form the application m applied to n. We'll write it like this. And that's going to be the result of type n. Okay. So that's going to be the application. Um, okay. And notice here it's a linear lambda calculus. So if you have a, a variable declared in your context when you're type checking a term, you have to decide if that variable occurs in the function part or in the argument part, but it can't appear in both. Okay. Because we have to split our assumptions, so any variable x will go to one side or the other. Okay. Okay. And then if we introduce and then eliminate that, so that would correspond to this part here being a function. So maybe it's worth writing that. Um, so let's write this over here. So if we have a delta comma x colon a, m colon b, and then in delta we have lambda x dot m a b, and delta prime, we have n colon a. <coughs> then we get delta, delta prime together, we get lambda x dot m. Applied to n is a term of type b. Okay. So now we said we can always eliminate if you introduce, if you can oh, get rid of this detour, if you introduce a connective and then eliminate it. So this was the arrow introduction, this was the elimination, okay. So how do we reduce a function applied to its argument? Substitution, right? So we would expect that we get something like this. Lambda x dot m applied to n reduces to n substituted for x in m, okay. And this, is, this particular local reduction is usually called the beta reduction in honor of the name that Church gave it when he first introduced the lambda calculus. Okay. So now we have to worry about whether at the, at the level of proofs this actually makes sense. At the level of functional terms, this clearly is what the computation does. You substitute n for x and m. So what we have to do is we have to take this proof here and substitute it in here, right? So what we want to do is, uh, what we want to show is this general uh, principle Actually, I'll write it over here, which we call substitution principle. So if um, uh, delta prime n colon a and delta x colon a m colon b, then delta and delta prime together show that uh, and substituted for x in m is a proof for b. Okay. Um, so you can also write this as an admissible rule if you want. Okay. That's legitimate. Okay. Or we can say this is the theorem of substitution or the principle of substitution. Okay. That um, it basically it's the way thing that defines the nature of a hypothetical judgment. When we have a hypothetical judgment, we have some assumptions here, something we're trying to prove, and it doesn't matter if it's linear or not in this case, then we, we can substitute for an assumption. And the way we carry that out is that we go over this proof here, the right-hand side, we keep going up, up, up in this term, right? And basically, we always apply to the induction hypothesis, nothing's going on, until x is being used somewhere. And wherever x is used, okay, we plug in n, 
which means that delta prime is not added as an assumption because the, you know, the initial, the hypothesis rule always looks like this, right? And so then after substitution, we get delta prime over here and then n, which has the right type, and then we rebuild the derivation, which is the way that the induction works. So this is a completely straightforward induction of the structure of this proof here. Or you can also say, because the terms that describe the proof, the induction over the structure of the term m, because terms corresponds to, correspond to proof in a very faithful way. So we can also think about as an induction over m. OK, um, okay. and so we, we need that here in order to know that this is still well-typed if this is well-typed. Okay. So what we have here is a kind of a, another example of an isomorphism between proofs and programs. Okay. So the proofs here are natural deductions in linear logic. And the programs are linear lambda terms, which compute two values. And we haven't, I haven't given you an operational semantics for that. Um, I've just given you the basic reduction rules. Okay. And proof reduction, which is things like an introduction followed by an elimination, corresponds to the computational reduction, which is substitution. Um, and you see that this particular place here is a big divergence between the sequence calculus and natural deduction, and that's the tricky part when we relate those two, which I want to do, do in today's lecture, but I'll do in another lecture, which is that this particular operation is a fairly big step because we go over the proof of M up here and we examine it all the way deep. The whole term M gets examined and n gets substituted wherever x occurs, okay? In the sequence calculus cut elimination, we take only these very small steps going upwards on both sides, okay? Until we, the cut meets an identity, for example, and then it goes away. Okay, so you can think of this as a functional computation on a lambda calculus proceeds in very big steps, which is beta reduction. And the concurrent computation that corresponds to the sequence calculus corresponds, computes in very, very small steps always just one, you know, one step upwards on both of the sides, okay? Um, so in one case, we substitute a whole term, and in the pi calculus, we only, like, rename a channel or send one channel. We don't send um, whole processes around, okay? Um, so we'll explore the connection between these two um, in, the next, in the next lecture. So I just want to complete the picture here now. And let's look at the tensor as one more example. And then I th yeah, have, still have enough time to introduce bang. Okay. So remember the, uh, okay, we'll remove that. Okay. So for the tensor, for the introduction rule, um, I do something like this. Um, uh, okay, so I do A tensor B. So it's also like a pair, because I get uh, A over here and delta prime B over here. So I get some M here, and I get some N here. Okay. Um, and I get another kind of pair. I have to distinguish it, because the pairs that I had before um, are for the width, for the additive conjunction. Um, and here. A common notation I've seen for that is like this, M tensor N. Okay, so we repeat the type construct at the level of terms. Okay. So remember, in the pairs that we had before, what happens is that when you have a, a linear variable in your context and you see where it appears, it has to appear both in M and in N. Okay because the right rule for width, which is the same rule, the room for the constructors, duplicates the context into the two pieces, right? It puts delta over here, and it puts the same delta over here, okay? Now, why was this okay? Why is it okay to propagate the delta into both branches, even though everything is supposed to be linear? because we can only extract one, right? With the first or second projection, the other one will be ignored, okay? Um, and here, okay, every variable must occur exactly on one side or the other, but not in both. Otherwise, you would get a conflict, okay? 
So from the point of view of the operational semantics, does it suggest something to you about these two different forms of pairs? Yeah? Right. So it would be strange, or maybe even unsound or something, if for this kind of a pair you would compute both m and n down to a value. Because only one of these twos will ever be used, plus you have only one set of these resources to compute m down to a value and n down to a value. If you try to compute both of them down to a value, you would have to reuse these resources more than once, once over here and once over here. Okay. So it would be some kind of violation of linearity if these pairs were actually eagerly computing the pieces. And in fact, you can see, if you don't compute them, okay, you get out one or the other component, you have saved the work of doing the other one. Okay. Now here, okay, you should eagerly com uh, compute you know, m and n, because all the resources can be split, so some of them go to the computation of n, and some of them go to the computation of n. And we should examine the elimination rule to make sure that that intuition actually is correct. Okay. So let's look at the elimination rule over there, um, okay, which is this one here. Okay, so if I put proof terms on that, I get something like this. In delta, uh, m is a proof of a tensor b. And then I get delta x colon a, y colon b. I get some n colon c. Okay, and the way I'm going to write that this is delta prime, sorry, delta together with delta prime. Well, the syntax I'm going to use is we take this m and we decompose it. So m is going to be some x tensor y. So let is a keyword here in n. I'm going to use that in n type c. Okay. So intuitively what you do here is you compute m to a value, and the value is this kind of a tensor pair with two components, and we bind the first component to x, the second component to y, and then we compute n. Okay. So but n uses, in fact, must use both of them. So computing those actually eagerly is okay, because you're going to use both of them when you compute n. Okay. So unlike the, the, the additive pairs, where we just have the, uh, the first and second projection, here we are going to use both pieces. So you might as well compute both pieces. So from the function perspective, this is the lazy pairs. And these are going to be the eager pairs. OK. And the reduction rule, by the way, it would be this. If you have let x tensor y equals m tensor m prime in n, then reduce it to m for x and m prime for y in n. Okay, so you can check that this, that this is correct because if this is really a tensor, okay, um, then we have two pieces. Okay. One is going to be of type A, another one of type B. So we can substitute into here both of them in sequence and we get the right answer out. Okay. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, questions on this before I go to bang? Okay, so we'll see more examples of that. But an interesting thing is that by going through linear logic, we can already get a distinction between eager and lazy pairs. Okay, um, it's perhaps a little bit. Um, you might say overkill to be completely linear here. Okay, so um, if you only want to capture la lazy versus eager, uh, linearity might be a little bit a strong thing to impose. Um, so there's other ways one can do that. Um, but um, anyway, if you look at the rules, you will see, you know, if you want to preserve the types on these things in the intuitive semantics, that the, the pairs formed with width should be lazy and they should be eager. Okay, so let's go back um, to how bang works. Okay, so um, we had a copy rule in the secret calculus. Okay, and what this corresponds to here is this rule. 
So we have gamma. Oh, so gamma consists of u1, a1, uk, a sub k. And then we have a delta, um, which in this particular rule, well, will be empty, but let me um, show you the general form first. Okay. So we have two different kinds of variables. The, one, the variables in gamma are not linear. The variables in delta are linear. So these variables here have to be used exactly once in the way that we discussed before. And the variables here can be used freely in M, just like in an ordinary lambda calculus. They have don't any restrictions. Okay. So, so we have this rule. If you have gamma and we have no linear assumptions, okay, um, then U has type A, assuming that U colon A is in gamma. Okay, so if it's declared in a new, unique way in the context gamma, by unique I mean, of course, these are all distinct, just like all the variables declared in delta are supposed to be different. So there can't be confusion. Okay. So we can use unrestricted variables as ordinary values. Okay. So that's one part. Um, okay, what else do we need to explain? Okay. Okay, so we need the, the right rule for bang, something like this. Okay, I'm going to leave room for the proof term here. Okay. Okay, that's the bang introduction rule. And it corresponds to the right rule, and there cannot be any ephemeral resources here that you use. And so, you just have to mark your territory here up and saying that if M is a proof of A that doesn't use any linear variable, then bang M is a proof of bang A. So there's nothing surprising there. Um, now for the elimination rule, we have to always deal with a general case. What if we can prove bang A? Okay, so how do we proceed in that case? How do we use when we have that? Right. That allows us to add an unrestricted variable u of type a to gamma. We have some delta prime. And whatever n we prove here, oh, sorry, whatever c we prove here, um, we're allowed to conclude. Okay? So it's a little bit, it kind of builds in the cut rule. A little, I mean, seems like it, right? Um, if, or the left rule, if you have bang A as an assumption on the left, then you're allowed to make the assumption A. Okay? Um, so it's actually not like the cut bang rule. It's more like, yeah, the left rule turned upside down, right? If you have that, then you can assume A. And so if you now put proof terms on these, this is going to be some m, this is going to be some n, and then this is going to be let bang u equals m in n. Okay. And so the reduction will look like this. If you have a let bang u equals bang m in n, then we reduce and we substitute n for u, uh, m for u, in n, okay? Um, now there's something funny about the substitution, or it's different from the substitution we had before. What is that? Right, exactly. So here we were, we were replacing n for x in exactly one place where it occurred in m, right? Right, so, yes, so if you have a width in here, then under this substitution thing, we have to put plug in n into several places, but it's only going to get used in one of them, okay? And here, okay, there might be multiple occurrences of u, and m is going to get used at every place where u occurs, okay? So there might be multiple places, because what we're doing is we're adding gamma in all these premises, and we propagate it always everywhere. 
Um, so gamma is propagated anywhere, no matter whether your term, term is, doesn't look very linear anymore. And so this gets used in every place where U occurs in N. Now, what does this suggest about lazy versus eager? Any thoughts on that here? Yeah, call by name versus call by value. So would you expect this to be more like call by name or call by value? Well, what about this? You want this to be called by value. Why is that? Because otherwise you could reevaluate M in many places. OK, so that would be one argument. But the other argument might be, well, maybe U doesn't occur at all. So maybe then there's no point of computing it. Uh, what about here? So the argument might be, well, X is going to be used exactly once. It might occur multiple times. So just use just once. So. No reason to hold off evaluating n. We might as well evaluate it because we know it's going to be used. It's guaranteed to be used, right? So at some level of abstraction, we might expect that this would correspond to like by value kind of discipline, maybe. And maybe this to some kind of by name discipline. Because when we're doing it like this, we're actually substituting m explicitly for all the occurrences of u, right? Which means that it would be multiple occurrence of m. Now, we'll have to see if that actually holds true, OK? But that might be some conjecture um, that we might form about the way we give an operational semantics to this. Yeah? You have an alternative point of view? Oh, uh, I'm just wondering whether it's possible to reuse the result we compute or the x. So oh. the downside of the combined name is that possibly you have to recompute the same stuff multiple times. Right. Right, so the question is, if we do this kind of thing, do we really have to compute m multiple times in every place where it occurs so we can kind of share the evaluation of m? Okay, okay. so that's an excellent question. And so um, I think I might just, um, we'll look at that question next time, then on Wednesday. Okay, so I've given you here um, a system of natural reduction for linear logic and the lambda calculus with some basic reductions where these reductions somehow, in some way or shape or form, could form the basis for an operational semantics. Okay. Um, but now we'll have to see how the operational semantics actually works out. And um, to just give you a preview, what we're going to try to do, um, let's see. Well, there's two different ways we can go. Okay. So one way is, um, we'll just take this and we try to derive an operational semantics for what I've just written down here, you know, somehow related to this notion of reduction. Okay. Another way we can do it is the following. Um, I've proven to you that you can translate from natural reduction to the sequence calculus. Right? You all believe that proof and it was pretty easy. So one thing we can do is we can take these terms M we can translate to the sequence calculus. What do they become under this translation? Processes. processes. And then we can run the processes, right? Because we already know how to run those. So if we do that, then what we get is a concurrent implementation of the linear lambda calculus, right? And actually, we shouldn't have to think because I already gave you the proof and I already gave you the process interpretation, right? So we can just see what comes out, okay? Or we can try to think of first principles. Well, this is my notion of beta reduction. Um, you know, these are my notion of beta reductions. How can I shape them into an operational semantics? Okay. And if we did everything right, then the both ways of looking at it should come out to be the same thing. Right? And if they're different, that would be interesting. It would be interesting to see where our direct interpretation of the lambda calculus would diverge from what the processes do on the lambda calculus. Okay. Um, Okay, so we'll do both. I'm not having really quite decided what we're going to do first. Okay. All right, so I guess, unless there are further questions. Okay, so then I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>